When our children disobey, we as parents have many creative ways of punishing them to try to prevent future disobedience. And when God judges a nation, he also has many ways of doing it. As events seem to be careening out of control around us, let's take a moment to review the means God may use in judging even our nation in the days ahead. Stay with us. From Chicago's Moody Church, this is Running to Win with Dr. Erwin Lutzer, whose clear teaching helps us make it across the finish line. Our current series is God and the Nations, and today, Dr. Lutzer comes to speak again on Understanding the Wrath of God. God's judgment takes many forms. The first one we've explored is that of natural disasters. Second, the deprivation of personal freedoms. I just chose one verse. Dozens could have been taken from the book of Judges and elsewhere. But Zechariah chapter 11, verse 6, For I will no longer have pity on the people of the land, declares the Lord. I will hand everyone over to his neighbor and his king. They will oppress the land, and I will not rescue them from their hands. God says you're going to be enslaved to others, and your personal freedoms will be taken away. Once again, not, let's not think that Russia and China are worse than we were because their personal freedoms were taken away under communism. Sometimes people must suffer because of their evil rulers. But one of the signs, one of the judgments of God upon a world that has neglected him is the fact that people always end up serving others and their personal freedoms are taken away. We think of America. I mentioned last time, isn't it an anomaly that you would have liberal groups that supposedly are the champions of freedom to be the greatest threat to religious freedom here in America. So that students can read pornography on the bus as part of their freedom, but according to one principle, not a Bible because the bus is public property and you can't have religion. And public property. Where is all this nonsense going to end anyway? Because of silly ideas of the separation of church and state and political correctness, which in itself would be a dozen sermons. But we must hurry on. Third, war. War. I chose just two passages again. It says in Isaiah chapter 10, verses 5 and 6, Woe to the Assyrian, the rod of my anger, in whose hand is the club of my wrath. I send him against a godless nation. I dispatch him against a people who anger me to seize loot and snatch plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 6, I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places not their own. I hope you understand how frustrated I am preaching. Because as I've been going through this, I'm thinking, you know, if I had the time, this would be a whole sermon, that would be a whole sermon, that would be a whole sermon. Take about a year to say everything that needs to be said. But isn't this interesting? Do you think that the Assyrians and the Babylonians were better than the people of Israel? Of course not. They were more wicked. They were pagans. They were sacrificing their kids to the fire and what have you. They were evil. But God says, I'm going to use a nation that is more evil than you to judge you. And when I continue this series of messages and talk about the United States of America and such things as terrorism, we're going to have to come back to this concept again. But notice what God says. I am raising up the Babylonians against you. I will use a people more evil than you to judge you because of your sins and your violence and your inability to call on God. Wow. Remember that in war, it is not always true that the best nation wins. It's not always true because God uses evil nations to judge those who should know better. Number four, deaf ears. Deaf ears. Isn't this 
interesting. If you were with us last time, you know that I mentioned that one of the sins for which God judges people is ears that will not hear. And I quoted a verse that says that when the word is preached, they stop up their ears so they do not hear. Now what we learn in Scripture is that if you're going to close your ears to the truth, God is going to make sure that your ears are closed as a judgment. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. He said, go and tell this people. He's talking to Isaiah. Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull, close their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. And God says, in the New Testament, Satan has blinded the minds of those who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. God says, you don't want to hear my word, I'll give you blindness and dull hearing so that you won't hear it. It's a judgment from me. Boy, we have to pause there, don't we? A number of years ago, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Nobel laureate, famous for Russian literature and his description of life under communism, giving a lecture at Harvard University and warned the students about America's pursuit of pleasure to the neglect of God and says that, that the, the student body should, should turn to God. And he was booed off the stage. We will not hear it. Eyes and ears dull of hearing. God in his providence has given me a good friend in London, England. He's a pastor there. And this past week I was at a conference and we were at the conference together. So we spent many hours talking about Europe and London. A letter was sent from the Willow Creek Association to the churches of London that says we want to meet with all of the super churches. We would call them in America mega churches. You know who the letter was sent to? Anyone whose congregation was 250 people or above. I tell you, I never have seen so many people as when we were in London a few years ago, down the streets, just rivers and rivers of people, just rivers and rivers. And you say, oh, 